Wow, uh, thanks. Thanks for coming. Um, so I was asked to talk about the communication system we built for uh, the TV show Lost in Space. Um, it was uh, one of the hardest jobs that I've ever uh, been a part of. Um, I, I have to say, um, you know, that on paper it seemed pretty simple. Uh, seven actors uh, that needed to be able to hear each other and needed to be able to um, talk and be recorded uh, and be able to converse naturally. Um, what it actually turned into was um, something that almost, um, to me, is the closest I've come to being involved in mission critical. You know, my background is a production sound mixer, um, so when we aren't able to record dialogue on a set, either because of too much noise or for whatever reason, uh, we were too hungover that morning, whatever the reason might be, um, you know, they can replace the dialogue. What I was not prepared for in Lost in Space uh, was if the actors can't communicate, uh, the whole thing grinds to a halt, and because stunts are involved, uh, can be quite dangerous. So uh, the initial requirements that we got were to allow eight actors in spacesuits to be able to listen and talk naturally. It had to work with the production sound mixer's gear, which could either be a Sonosax mixer or a Zaxcom recorder. And it had to uh, work with their existing wireless, as well as uh, what the headset mic and earpiece was that was established the previous season. And it had to be, of course, rugged and portable and work on 12 volts. And oh yeah, they wanted it to be able to integrate with cedar noise reduction. So that meant because of the cedar requirements, it had to be eight AES in and out. It had to be eight AES from the Zaxcom recorder or the Sonosax mixer, um, because each actor needed to hear their own mix. It meant we had to be able to find a device that could create eight mix minuses. And just some background: uh, the first season, they had tried a system where every actor got the same mix. And that means that every actor hears their own voice uh, coming back at them full volume, which I can tell you right now is super distracting. Um, and also it meant, and, and I'll have some pictures that they've allowed me to share, um, because the nature of the helmet was mostly glass in front of their face, it meant if the earpiece fell out, which they were doing stunts, um, or any other kind of signal condition that was created um, happened, there would be full feedback, not just for the person, but for everybody. So that was really what propelled them to come up with a solution uh, that was not going to do that. And I, I even wonder um, if this was also actor driven. I mean, this really was about their well-being. Um, the first thing I tried to do when I got to set was I asked if I could try the helmet on. And it takes two people to put the helmet on and you have to turn your head in a certain way or you cut the bridge of your nose. So imagining what that was like for them the first season with feedback going and you can't stop it because you can't get at anything and you can't rip off the helmet. Uh, I knew the, the stakes were pretty high for all, for all of us. They wanted an analog in for the director um, to be able to talk on a handheld mic to the actors. And then they also wanted uh, stunt coordinators to be able to talk um, through a walkie-talkie into the system. If we could add some EQ to kind of isolate voice frequencies or some compression, um, that would be even, you know, a sweeter bonus. So, of course, the ULN-8 came to the rescue um, for us. It was, and I would argue, still the only device on the market that can do all of the things we needed to do. It's super rugged, very reliable, rock solid. 
It has uh, eight in, eight out analog I.O. The edge card provided an additional eight AES as well as the eight AES I.O. natively on the, on the device. The DSP allowed very sophisticated mix minuses to be created and to the point where each actor could dial in the, their own voice to the uh, desire that they had. And also as a bonus, uh, it could record or you know, the, the host application can record which came in handy when we wanted to check things or uh, you know, tweak things after the fact. So uh, this was what the signal diagram became. It started out much prettier than this, but I'll, I'll walk you through some of the components. Starting at the bottom, the mixer used Electrosonics Wireless that fed, um, I'm showing in this example, the Sonosax mixer. Uh, we went AES out of the Sonosax into the ULN8 and then uh, using the edge card, we went in and out of the Cedar DNS-8 so it can act as a kind of insert for noise reduction. One of the reasons we needed noise reduction was, and actually the main reason, because it was an all glass helmet, they needed a ventilation system not just for actor comfort, but for defogging the glass. Now, I will tell uh, one anecdote uh, about that, which is at one point uh, we were shooting and they removed all the glass from the actor's helmets. And uh, I kind of raised my hand and I said, you know, not for nothing, but if you did the whole shoot with no glass, uh, you wouldn't need me or this device. And they said, let me explain the pecking order that goes on. Uh, it is more expensive to remove bad reflections from the glass than it is to add good reflections to the glass. And you are cheaper than both of those things, so you have to stay. Um, so that was sort of, uh, yeah, so much for being able to go home early. Anyways, 8 AES in and out of the uh, Cedar DNS-8 allowed us to have it, have it as an insert. And then analog, we fed analog into Electrosonics M2Ts which became uh, their IFB feeds. Each one got uh, their own mix through the Electrosonics IEM system. We chose the Electrosonics IEM system because it's uh, natively 12 volts and also uh, its transmission scheme allows for two audio signals per RF carrier, um, which because we're dealing with um, you know, seven body packs coming in and now you know, seven signals going out. The, uh, the idea of cutting down on the number of RF carriers was important. Um, finally, that went into an antenna combiner, the only part of the system that needed AC, unfortunately, um, so that all of the IM signals could be fed into one antenna. So this is uh, what the console ended up looking like. We had the inputs here. Uh, this was an extra, extra bonus. Uh, the first channel strip, sometimes the actors would request music uh, through the comm system and we could just pipe it in through iTunes right into their system. So that's the first channel. The next two channels are the voice of God and the walkie-talkie input. Um, and then AES from the mixer's um, recorder. And you can see here, for example, the music and all the voice of God stuff goes to everybody but each output is minus its own input. Each mix is minus its own input, hence the term mix minus. And then finally, on the output side, we have all the analog outs going to the IEMs. And we kind of kept this screen going, specifically so that they could have ready access, and some people were quieter than others, um, some people wanted more gain in their IFE than others, and, and just having it here um, allowed it to, to really um, have ready access to every control, something that the Mio console allows you to do. You can really dial in exactly the channel order that you want. Oh, right, sorry. So, um, flowing down, um, the first uh, thing, and I'm sorry I didn't um, get a screen grab of the Mio strip, but um, the Mio strip allows us to apply EQ and compression. One of the challenges of this is it's not just like a rock'em sock'em space show, it's really uh, a kind of family drama disguised as a rock'em sock'em space show. So there are some scenes that are very quiet and some scenes that are very loud. And you know, from a communication system, 
the actors need to be able to hear the end of one line of dialogue before they start theirs. And so this system needed to accommodate that. I think that was something that everybody really needed to be trained for because a normal communications system, part of that system is telling people to speak up. But you can't just say that in a drama. You know, you have to give the actors the flexibility to deliver at the volumes that they're going to deliver at. Um, so the Mio strip is DSP um, uh, in the in the ULN8 that allows us to apply EQ and compression, and then the IO insert allows us to set up the Cedar DNS8 as a true insert, a send and a return, and then you know that had its own control page. So yeah, that was super flexible, and um, you know if the Cedar DNS8 was getting in the way, hurting more than helping very easy to just kind of turn it off from here um, so um, yeah I think it's important to talk about the ULN 8's latency which is near zero I mean not not detectable the cedar added minimal latency um, so in terms of um, you know sending and receiving um, we didn't do any measuring uh, but we did do sort of quiet testing um, and nobody had an issue. I mean, I would, you know, um, without having done a scientific measurement, I would say it's in the order of five to six milliseconds end to end, um, including the, you know, the electrosonics has latency. Um, the Mio really doesn't have latency, but the Cedar had a little bit, and the electrosonic send had some latency. So it was very, very minimal. Um, and there's some pictures we can show and some we can't, but this is from the trailer that's public. Yeah, and this is a very typical scene. I, I happen to have been there, and this was uh, them sort of like talking about what they're going to do next. You know, some of the scene was uh, they were very nervous, and some of it they were very excited. Um, all of it had the sound of the ventilation system, which uh, sounded something like <laughs> over the whole thing. Super annoying. It, it had to, um, you know, accommodate all of those things. The one thing that I, I'll say is uh, there were a lot of challenges and there was no manual for how to deal with this stuff. Um, so uh, this is Elliot, the, uh, one of the props people. Um, this is Ray, our sound utility. You know, I think from sound's perspective, this was all of the sound crews said they've never, ever uh, had a job like this since this. It was really... Um, so labor intensive. Um, once they were suited up, these were some preliminary tests. Once they were suited up, um, you really, it was at least five to seven minutes to get at them to change something. So um, it required all uh, departments to work together, wardrobe and props and sound mainly. This is an early example of uh, something gone awry. And before we get into this, I have to say something. I could literally end uh, the metric halo part of this right now. Because from the metric halo perspective, we turned it on in the morning and didn't touch it until wrap. Like, it just worked. Um, so all of the stuff I'm telling you is uh, the trials and tribulations to get stuff into the metric halo unit. So, the, because we had ready access to stuff, if, if, you know, the earpiece did occasionally fall out, in the end, um, what, uh, and this is really uh, wardrobe props and, sound, and the sound department figured out, they just taped the earpiece over the ear with medical tape so that it was impossible for it to fall out. Um, but, uh, you know, because we had individual sends for everybody on their own RF feed, if something catastrophic was happening, we could just mute it quickly. Um, and that's all from the console. What's that? Uh, there was a gate in the Mio, in the Mio strip. Um, the problem with the gate is it had to be set really conservatively because some of the dialogue would be, yeah, would, you know, and there was no way to kind of come up with one. It was better to kind of um, have somebody uh, be able to jump uh, on it and, and lower it. But truthfully, once they figured out the tape, there's never, feedback was never an issue. Um, 
So I'm just talking now generally because basically the Mio, Mio system worked, Metro Halo worked. So I want you to pay special attention to the buttons here. This was where we wanted to put all the packs. You'll note that it's in waterproof um, bags be specifically because there was going to be water involved and the stuff was going to get wet. When they were fully suited up, we did a test, but the suit ended up pushing on the buttons. So in the middle of one of the tests, uh, the stunt performer said, I can't hear anything. And my first uh, impulse was to just replace the pack. And to the first AD's credit, the first assistant director's credit, he said, no, no, this is a test. Let's figure out what went wrong. And it turned out that at the time, the firmware for this particular receiver, even if you put it into lock mode, it didn't lock, and the first setting it came to was scan a new frequency. So that meant that we had to put the packs in their kind of fake breathing pack with all the electronics and their newly um, metallic paint coat, which meant that our RF range was suddenly reduced in half. But it was the only place that we could put stuff where there wasn't a danger of anything getting touched or moved accidentally. Yeah, and this is um, one of the spectrum analyzer screen grabs I took. These are all the RF carriers we were dealing with. Um, just if you're curious about this thing, we separated the sends from the receives by about 40 megahertz um, so that that way when they were on the body, uh, we weren't desensing the receiver. The day before I landed, they said, um, so tomorrow's the water test. And I said, I knew about the test, I didn't know about the water. So this was in front of the studios that they did, dousing uh, them with water. This was the day that the pack, um, you know, the buttons got pushed. Um, it was also the day that everybody realized to get at the controls was a big deal. So this is sort of the evolution of the rig. We put it in a shock-mounted case. We quickly realized it needed to be on a cart. So that's sort of um, one of the final incarnations of it on a cart. Mac laptop on top, you know, we had some uh, power distribution, DC power distribution acting as a UPS with an inverter, of course, the ULN-8 there at the, at the heart of it. Again, one of the challenges is it all, including the entire sound equipment, had to be packed in a van that traveled with the company. You know, everything got packed away at night, so it really could not be a whole rack case worth of stuff. You know, prep was key. That's Marie, uh, one of the war on-set wardrobe supervisors. Um, that's the DPA headset mic and earpiece that they were um, married to for season one. It looks great. It sounds great. Not meant for communications. I think they, would, they might agree with that. Certainly not in, in um, high noise environments. Yeah, and so really a routine had to be developed. There's Ray and Eli and, and Graham, the production mixer. You know, Everything had to get prepped in the morning. We came up with common sense stuff, like don't let an actor walk to set unless they confirm that they can hear you and you can hear them. And so, you know, one of the things we learned the hard way was I had a walkie-talkie, and if you were the actor getting wired before we let you go, I would cue the walkie and say, can you hear me talk? And the first time we expected them to give a thumbs up. and it, we kept having to test it, we would recheck it, they couldn't hear us, I would cue the walkie, can you hear me, until finally it dawned on me, they could hear me if I stood 10 feet away from them, but not when I was close to them, the walkie was desensing their IFB pack. Um, so, you know, things like that were definitely learned the hard way. You know, I wish I could sort of like del delve more into the ULN-8 intricacies, I'm happy to answer any questions. But for me, the big takeaway is uh, the ULN-8 worked solidly. And I will love to talk about um, you know, stuff that uh, would exist in the future. Um, one of the things that uh, I think we'd ap uh, appreciate is uh, not needing a Mac computer to um, get it to go in the morning. Oh, you didn't have to do anything. Once it saw the console, it would just go. Um, and DJ tells me that that's an announced feature uh, where it can remember its previous state. So you don't need a computer unless you want to make a change, um, which is uh, super welcome. And um, yeah, the more we can incorporate 
into it. Um, you know, noise reduction, any any of those features would be uh, welcome additions. Uh, almost a year ago, I came back from Vancouver. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Uh, I'm just going to repeat what you said. Yeah, our rock solid experience was the first beta, um, which yeah, I mean, really, the like, there was never a moment where we scratched our heads because of ULNA. Um, yeah. Any any uh, questions generally or yeah. Dynamics. Well, I, you know, we used um, we used one. There's there's um, a building block uh, that's called Mio Strip um, that mimics like a channel strip, and that was the only one we used. But there are, um, I mean, we could have done. Uh, is there a limit to the number of building blocks we could have done, DJ? Like, if we really wanted to apply different EQs along the strip, ten slots. So, and the building blocks are pretty specific, um, you know, you can get pretty detailed in terms of like, I think there's three band and uh, 12 band EQ, yeah. So, I mean, if there was something to notch, we could have notched it, but it was just a broad band noise. Yeah, it's kind of all in one for the Neostrip. So ju I'm just going to repeat the question, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the question was any plans to incorporate additional DSP, and the answer was the more we hear about people's needs, uh, we being Metric Halo, the better off we are. Yeah, specifically, like, auto mix, auto mix and noise reduction. And noise reduction. I'll go back to the uh, wacky diagram. So, forgetting about the optional cards for a minute, um, natively you have um, AES in and out. You have um, uh, eight mic, eight line level, um, and eight outputs, eight send outputs, analog sends, as well as um, they're kind of like a through, right? The, the other and. Crucially, you get to the computer, uh, you can do it via MHLink, which is uh, e Ethernet. Um, it's, it's, their, it's Metric Halo's own protocol, but it's got all kinds of advantages in terms of very, very low sample level latency. Um, and USB, uh, USB-C. We, we actually found it easier to use it in USB-C mode for some reason, um, just for their implementation. Yeah, but... Uh, you know, it just no issues, and, and uh, we just kept it that way. Um, but it, you know, it did mean if we switched over to the Ethernet, we could have remoted the whole box and just had the computer on the cart. Uh, it doesn't record in the box, but it does record in software. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of. I, th I think we can kind of flip over. Yeah. So there it is recording. Yeah.
and there's um, you know basic metadata available, but it, it, it's a broadcast wave file readable by all the post-production softwares that we needed to read, be read by. Yeah, and time code capable, yeah. So on the film, you were recording with the software as well as or just production? Uh, uh, I was just using the recording feature for um, uh, you know going over it uh, after the fact or you know to to test different scenarios out and and you know one of the challenges is you're on set you can't really monitor what the actor's hearing because it's so noisy around you so I would take him back to the hotel room listen see if if it made a difference. Um, yeah, it was really for diagnostic purposes, um, but yeah, could have been used for any other purpose. It's a full-on time code uh, broadcast wave capable recorder. I, I feel like I should close with one story um, where I kind of realized how critical it was that the ULN-8 not fail. Um, there was a stunt with um, uh, where the stunt performer had to climb up a ladder outside in a quarry uh, with water being jetted down and, you know, in that spacesuit. And the stunt woman was climbing and at one point she said, I'm slipping. Now, she was in a harness, but, you know, the, uh, the way they were doing it was they were keeping it slack. Um, but the stunt helper heard her say that through the comm system and immediately started to tighten up on the harness. And so she let go and she just safely sort of swung where she was. And it made me realize if he didn't hear her say that, she would have been all right, but she would have fell and then the harness would have caught her hard. And God forbid, you know, she got hurt. Uh, that, you know, I, I couldn't have lived with that. Uh, and that really brought it home. That was early on in this process. Um, yeah, this when they say mission critical, we've all heard that term. Uh, but this really had a, an extra element of truth to that. So thank you for making such a great, solid product. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Steve.